Review Brothers. Welcome to our 2024 and 2025 Men's Bible Teach <clears throat> teaching, featuring one of Scripture's great, relevant, and potentially life-changing books, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, which for my overview teaching today, I'll call Acts. I'm Mike Bodine, a shepherd. In a short time of this overview, my goal is not to do uh, extensive teaching. Your weekly studies ahead will richly bless you in those regards. My goal is that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will whet your appetite for more of Jesus. In church circles, we often hear the word transformation because that's what the Christ life does through the Holy Spirit in us as we yield to him and seek his face. My prayer is that this time of study, prayer, and fellowship with your brothers uh, will further transform you and mold you into the image of Christ. Please pray with me. Oh, Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for this book of Acts. Lord, uh, what a great season of, of uh, learning and fellowship we can have coming up here. And I pray a blessing on these men um, that you will touch their hearts, that indeed your Holy Spirit will impact their lives, Lord, through the teaching uh, in this great book. So, Lord, we just want to commend this whole season to you. And, uh, and now, Lord, we just commend this teaching to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first of all, I guess we'll start with the title, uh, The Acts of the Apostles. Well, yes, each apostle is named in the book. Most of them, however, are only mentioned uh, once in chapter 1. Two apostles, uh, Peter and Paul, make up the greater apostolic representation in this book. So, I like the title, The Acts of Jesus Continues. What is Acts? Acts is the second book from a man named Luke that continues the messianic story of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Luke tells us this story in two parts. The first 30 years is focused on the life of Jesus, we know as the Gospel of Luke, including his miraculous virgin birth, growing into his three and a half years of earthly ministry. Uh, Luke further records the gospel work of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Both Luke and Acts were probably written sometime uh, between uh, 60 and 65 AD. Bible commentator, author, and theologian James Boyce pointed out that ancient books written on papyrus scrolls would have a practical limit of about 35 feet in length. And if it got longer than that, it would be too bulky to carry. He surmised then that Luke used two scrolls to tell his story, hence the Gospel of Luke and, and the Book of Acts. A.T. Pearson, noted 19th and 20th century Bible teacher, missionary, friend and contemporaries with D.L. Moody and George Mueller, said this, he said that the Acts of the Apostles should therefore be studied mainly for this double purpose. First, to trace our Lord's unseen but actual continuance of his divine teaching and working. And secondly, to trace the active ministry of the Holy Spirit as the abiding presence in the church. A major theme of Acts is the blessing of the gospel message about the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant that Abraham's lineage would bless all the earth. This book records salvation's history. Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The next 30 years, which takes up the period of time in our Acts study, tells the story of the apostles obeying the Great Commission in Acts, uh, or excuse me, in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, <clears throat> I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Acts is a transition from the gospel messages about Jesus the Messiah to the letters of the New Testament. Consider what it would be like to have Acts and go right into Paul's letter to the Romans. Who's Paul? What's his story? What about Peter? When last we saw Peter, he was trying to recover from his failure of denying Jesus. And did the apostles obey Jesus' great commission? They must have, but how? Acts gives us honest answers to those and far more. So, what do we know, know about our author, Luke? Well, he is the only non-Jewish writer in the New Testament. He was an historian. W.M. Ramsey, a 19th and 20th century historian, said that Luke should be considered among the greatest historians ever. He is the greatest New Testament writer in terms of volume. Luke wrote over 25% of the New Testament. His books are greater than any other New Testament writer, including Paul. Luke and Paul together wrote over half of the New Testament. Luke was not just an outside observer. He actively participated with Paul in his second missionary journey for a number of more years towards the end of Paul's life. Paul calls Luke the beloved physician, see Colossians 4.14. This relationship was far greater than being buddies or a doctor-patient relationship. The word beloved in the Greek Paul used to describe his relationship with Luke is agapatis, the highest form of love, such as God's love for Jesus when he said in Matthew 3.17, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Luke was one of Paul's most loyal friends. See 2 Timothy 4.11. Demas has deserted me. Luke alone is with me. The author never mentions his own name in the Gospel of Luke or Acts, like, say, the apostles Peter and Paul commonly do. But there's little to no argument from historians and Bible scholars that Luke indeed was the author of these two works. Why did Luke write these accounts? What was his purpose? Luke 1, 1 to 4 provides us with Luke's clear purpose for his gospel narrative. He said this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So Luke's gospel narrative was written to one man, a man named Theophilus, which means lover of God. As Luke stated to Theo, which is what I'm going to call him here, many were writing about Jesus' story. Luke was no doubt fact-checking these other stories, which no doubt contained inaccuracies. Knowing what Luke know, knew from hanging out with reliable first-hand eyewitnesses, including himself, who personally joined Paul and other disciples in Paul's second missionary journey, he felt he could provide a reliably and orderly account. In the Acts continuation, this writing is to the same man, though we don't know much about Theo, we surmise a few things. Luke used the greeting, most excellent Theophilus, Theophilus, an indication that Theo may have been a high-ranking official. He was probably wealthy. Some historians also thought it possible that Luke may have been a slave to Theo and a new convert to the faith who gave Luke his release. Understanding the importance of Luke's discourses, it's also a possibility that Theo could have helped fund the project. This is purely conjecture. Nobody knows, but it's a possibility. In Acts, Luke is addressing Theo and gives the reason for the sequel. Acts 1, 1-2 says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
Note the words, began to do and teach. Well, Jesus was taken up to heaven, which begs the question, when does he continue to do and to teach? He's out of here. Ah, that's what Acts is all about. Acts is Jesus continuing to do and to teach through his disciples, except that now he's with his disciples in spirit. Just as much as he was 2,000 years ago in the flesh, only now his doing and teaching, signs and wonders are in the power of the Holy Spirit, working in and through them. But not just them, but us as well. Though Peter and Paul are mentioned predominantly, what sticks out to me are the many other non-apostle disciples. For instance, there's a man named Stephen, whose martyrdom and the ensuing persecution that followed started the spread of the church to the ends of the earth. Another non-apostle, Philip, shared Christ with a governmental leader from Africa, who received Christ, got baptized, then joyfully headed back to Africa, while Philip was miraculously whisked away to another city. Others, such as Barnabas, known as a son of encouragement, later to become an apostle. Tabitha, John Mark, Cornelius, Lydia, Apollos, the prophet Agabus, and many others are stories awaiting us in this great book. There are villains as well. In chapter 1, we're reminded of Judas's betrayal, selling out the Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, with his life ending in a gruesome suicide. And Acts continues to paint Jewish religious leaders, yeah, the same ones crucified our Lord in a very unfavorable light. There's a magician wanting to buy off the Holy Spirit for money. A young slave girl possessed by a demon spirit bringing financial profit to her owners and then Paul casting out that spirit. There's a couple who are part of the Jerusalem church who lied to the Holy Spirit in order to look good to others and were immediately assassinated by the Lord. You won't find uh, that word uh, in the Bible. That, that's my own. This is that story. How the disciples, normal everyday people who loved and followed Jesus like you and me, who gave up their lives, even in some cases gave up all their property, and began to carry out the Lord's great commission to go into all the world, proclaiming the good news of salvation by being a witness of the living Christ. So, now that Jesus was resurrected and indescribably alive, his disciples peppered him with a very good question in Acts 1, 6-7. The question is, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now, Rather than answering the question, Lord, will you, Jesus said in Acts 1.8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This one verse tells us so much. It gives us the church's purpose to be witnesses for the risen Christ, the Messiah Jesus. It tells us where they will be witnesses to the living Christ, starting at Jerusalem, going into all Judea and Samaria, and culminating to the end of the earth. It gives them a start date when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. There are a number of ways to outline Acts. You could do it in two parts, chapters 1 through 12, which would be the missionary efforts to the Jews. And then the rest of the book in chapters 13 to 28 could be the missionary efforts to the Gentiles. Our Life Change study book provides it in three threes based on Acts 1-8. Jerusalem chapters 1 through 7, Judea and Samaria chapters 8 through 11, and the nations chapters 12 through 28, the rest of the book. Chapters 1 through 7 begins in Jerusalem and includes a period of 40 days of preparation as Jesus appears often to the disciples and ministers to them about the kingdom of God. 
During this time, he is clearly, physically showing them that he's alive, not a spirit. He eats fish with them. Jesus then ascends into heaven and is throned on God's right hand. After commanding his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. The first business meeting following Jesus' ascension has the apostles choose Matthias to replace Judas as the twelfth apostle. And then comes Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, upon the now numbered 120 disciples in an upper room in, in Jerusalem. This is Acts chapter 2. A great noise of wind, tongues of fire, and the disciples speaking in 17 languages about the glories of God. This amazing disturbance causes thousands to hear Peter's first sermon as he explains what they were seeing was the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, which resulted in 3,000 getting saved. Joel 2.28 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants. I will pour out my Spirit in those days. The first miracle of the church is recorded in chapter 3. And following that, Peter preaches again, and then 5,000 more are saved. The Lord daily increases the number of converts to the faith. The church is on a roll. The success of the early church, however, is not embraced by everyone. Following the healing of the lame man, which just happened to be on the Sabbath, the religious leaders again come against the Lord, but this time via his disciples. No doubt his disciples recalled Jesus' warning from John 15, that if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. The Holy Spirit emboldened Peter and John push back against these religious leaders, stating they will obey God rather than man. In a powerful church prayer meeting, asking the Lord to give them boldness in proclaiming the good news that Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit again falls on the disciples, granting them their request by the filling of the Spirit, enabling them to speak the word of God with boldness. Chapters 6 and 7 have to do with the selection of deacons by the apostles. One of the deacons, Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, faced opposition from the Jews, which enabled him to give one of the longest recorded sermons in Scripture. As he recalled history from the promises made to Abraham up to the current time, accusing them of betraying and murdering Jesus, for which he became the first martyr of the church age. In chapters 8 through 12, the martyrdom of Stephen had resulted in many of the Christians scattering. These chapters begin a shift as the Holy Spirit comes upon the Gentiles, with churches springing up in Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. These scattered Christians before this time were sharing the gospel with Jews only. Incidentally, the followers of Jesus were first called Christians in Antioch. Before this, they were widely known as the Way. The preaching of the gospel goes to Judea and Samaria, which includes the conversion of an Ethiopian eunuch, with Philip, one of the seven deacons, and the miraculous life-changing conversion of a guy named Saul from Tarsus, later be known as Paul. With the conversion of Paul, God's eternal plan and his promise to Abraham and his descendants begins to come into focus as the Jewish leadership continues to reject Jesus. To where Paul finally says, Jews, you've had your chance. You continue to reject the gospel of Jesus the Messiah. We're going to take this message to the Gentiles. The Lord will now use Paul, the former accomplice to murder, and chief church persecutor to reveal God's great mystery of the church, namely that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, but they are now both in one body, the body of Christ, the church. 
through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and forgiveness of sins. Chapters 13, 28 shows the work of Jesus by the Holy Spirit through the disciples, taking the gospel truth to the uttermost ends of the earth, proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is alive. In these chapters, four of Paul's seafaring journeys are recorded by our author Luke, including three of his missionary journeys and a journey while he was under Rome's house arrest. In chapter 16, we learn that our author Luke has joined the seafaring voyages in Paul's second missionary journey. In chapter 20, Paul preaches a sermon all night that results in a young listener dozing off and falling out of a three-story building, killing him. But God, through Paul, revives the dead man. Paul also addresses the Ephesian elders, warning them to be on the alert for fierce wolves who could rise up in their midst, speaking untruths. Chapter 21, Paul is arrested on a bogus charge of defiling the temple with a Gentile in the temple court area. The final chapters of Acts, Luke provides us with a chronology of Paul's exciting journey to Rome including a number of speakings of the Holy Spirit, foretelling Paul's troubles ahead, a shipwreck and a viper's bite that Paul survives on the island of Malta, the healing of islanders, and more. And then, almost abruptly, the book ends, saying that Paul remained under house arrest for two years, but is allowed to meet with visitors and friends. But brothers, Acts didn't end 2,000 years ago. Acts is not a two-part book that ended. It's a trilogy. It's a trilogy of the work of the triune God in us, his body, the church. The great message of Acts is that we are now included in this ongoing saga. Book three is and will continue to be written about the Lord's people, us, witnessing of the living Christ, to our family, neighbors, friends, co-workers, strangers, Jew and Gentile, until he returns. Acts is a story of the church's beginning and empowerment. Following the Lord Jesus for those three and a half years, the disciples also had the Holy Spirit who was in Jesus, so also with them. Following the Lord's resurrection, Jesus breathed in, into them his spirit. So the disciples now had the spirit of Jesus in them. They become a new creation, never to lose him. This is true of us too. But for the humanly impossible mission before them, that would not be enough. They would need power, which is exactly what Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, gave them that day of Pentecost but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Much of the Holy Spirit's ministry is mystery. Acts, and especially Paul's letters to the churches, give us terms such as the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that we were baptized into one spirit, being led by the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit, speaking in the Spirit, living by the Spirit, the love of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, and, and dozens more. But what do all these things mean? More importantly, can I get the good of all this? Or is that something that happened a couple thousand years ago? To be honest, the Western Church today doesn't much talk about the Holy Spirit, except in some particular uh, churches. When we are miraculously born again, and make, mo and make no mistake, salvation is a miracle. I believe that we have received everything of the Spirit, but in our subjective experience of the Christ life, Another question arises, an important question, brothers. Does the Holy Spirit have everything of me? Brothers, 
If he does, your life will change. Have I yield and sur- yielded and surrendered my life completely to the Lord? Which is another way of asking if I have taken up my cross daily to follow him. Ah, this is where we need power daily. What I have learned personally, experienced and practiced, especially in these latter years, comes from the book of Ephesians. You know the verse, Ephesians 5.18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. In this one verse, Paul gives two commands. Don't get drunk with alcohol, be filled in Spirit. We usually focus on that first command, but have you considered that the other, to be filled in spirit, is also a command? To me, that means in both cases, I have a choice. The filling of the spirit is up to me. How does that work? Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 to 13, He says, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? When I am filled in spirit, I believe, I am being led by the Spirit, that I am walking in the Spirit, that I will exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. When I need the right words to speak, the Holy Spirit will at that time give me those words. He has proven that to me over and over. If I need miraculous intervention for something, or in particular, boldness to speak the truth about Jesus, the Holy Spirit will come upon me. You might challenge me on that, but let me remind you of your own experiences that when you shared Jesus with someone before, it seemed like your words were not your words, like an out-of-body experience. And further, the person that you were sharing Jesus with was glued in attention to you. Well, brother, that wasn't you. Incidentally, The term baptized in the Spirit does not mean speaking in tongues. Though that could happen, it literally means to be immersed in the Spirit. Brothers, a question again. Do you want to be immersed in the Spirit of Jesus? Are you willing to give the Lord the reins of your life? Are you willing for another life to take over your life? Are you willing to release your heart of unforgiveness that you've held on to for years? Or that root of bitterness that's been crushing you? Or that idol of pornography that's destroying you and your family? Or your intentional status seeking? Or your overt wealth building? or revenge that's eating you alive. Forgive your spouse for the 77th time. If you're willing, the Father is willing, ask him. Like Luke 11:9, Jesus says, ask, seek, knock. He will open the door. But maybe you're not, maybe you're honestly not willing. I have good news for you too, brothers. Philippians 2.13 says that it is God who works in you to give you the willingness and the power to do it. Finally, brothers, I encourage you to allow Acts to be a springboard into seeking out our God. The Spirit to discover how today and each day how we can play our part in this great drama of being a witness for Jesus to a terribly lost world. Thank you, brothers. Uh, Thanks for taking the time to uh, check this out. May you really be blessed. May you follow the Lord with all you've got. 
In Jesus' name, amen.